Hello, my name is Nikolai Yusupov, and in this video, I'd like to talk about what's the purpose of an OPA. Now, oftentimes, when I ask my students what is the purpose of an OPA, a lot of them tell me it's to keep the tongue out of the airway, and that is actually false. If you look at this mannequin cutout, all these mannequins are made with fixed tongue in an open position so it doesn't occlude the laryngeal inlet. However, on a person who is unconscious, this muscle especially here, the genial glossus muscle, which is attached to the mandible, the lower jaw, it relaxes and it's going to fall back like that. So no OPA in place will lift this tongue out of the laryngeal inlet, right? What will lift the tongue from the laryngeal inlet is you performing a jaw lift technique, right? Where you actually find the ascending remy and you lift the jaw up to the ceiling like I'm doing now. Right? And I talked about the triple area maneuver for patients who have no cervical spine injury, right? Elevation of the mandible and extension of the atlanto occipital joint. And for patients who you suspect cervical spine injury, just the elevation of the jaw. Now you will say, so what's the purpose of an OPA then? So the purpose of an OPA then is to not allow the operator to close the mouth when they're ventilating the patient. And notice that I have uh, nasal trumpets or nasal pharyngeal airways here and OPA in place. And when the patient is not breathing and you come to ventilate and your set is not improving, you, what you tend to do, you tend to uh, get a tighter seal and your hand, right, starts to close the mouth. So you're creating the tighter seal and inadvertently you're closing the mouth. So the purpose of, of the OPA is not to keep the tongue out of the airway. The purpose of an OPA is not to allow the operator from closing the mouth. You also tend to close the mouth when you squeeze two hands around the mask like so, and you tend to, again, close the mouth this way. An OPA will prevent you from doing that, okay? so that you can ventilate the patient uh, in some way. Now, as I said, this, this technique and this technique is very poor technique, and the techniques you should be employing is essentially the triple airway maneuver that the Peter Sefar outlined, right? Lifting the mandible, right? Using your thumbs to keep the mouth from closing, creating a good seal, and lifting the head back. You notice that my hands are nowhere near on the lower mandible, and this technique will not allow me to even close the mouth. So using the poor technique with one hand EC clamp or two hand EC clamp uh, is not what you want to do. So this is why they employ the OPA. Now, how to size the OPA? So oftentimes you guys hear you size the OPA how? From the corner of the mouth to the angle of the jaw. And I'm going to show you a study that tested this technique versus sizing from central incisors to the angle of the mandible. And from the central incisors to the angle of the mandible, they found on average 6 to 8% of the patients had a better ventilatory uh, effort on the patient. So the way you should be sizing the OP is from the central incisors, this is the central teeth of the patient, to the angle of the jaw. And how are you going to insert it? Cross finger technique to open the mouth. You could go from the roof of the mouth and ro rotate it 180. And the other one, you could go 90 degrees, right, and rotate it. Patient who is unconscious, right, will not have intact gag reflex. They'll accept the OPA. And then you can go ahead, perform your triple airy maneuver, right, and ventilate the patient uh, accordingly, right? So uh, just to show you how this will look, uh, if the tongue has fallen back like this, right, and even if you put the OPA, there's no way this OPA is moving the tongue forward, right? As you could see, the only technique, the only motion that I can perform to move this tongue out of the airway or laryngeal inlet, I have to use the triple air maneuver to move the jaw upwards. Once I move the jaw upwards and I move the genial glossus muscle along with it, right, then I have uh, ability to ventilate the patient. And this is, again, this device, the OPA, is to prevent the operator from closing the mouth. So let me show you the studies that I reference. So a big misconception is that the OPA by itself is used to keep the tongue from the airway. And a lot of the studies were done by uh, Peter Joseph Safar in the late 1950s. He was uh, anesthesiologist at Baltimore City Hospital. So the first study I'm going to talk about was published in New England Journal of Medicine. It was titled, A Comparison of the Mouth-to-Mouth -mouth and Mouth-to-Airway Methods of Artificial Respiration with Chest Pressure Arm Lift Methods. And what the data showed is that our data demonstrated that the obstruction of the pharynx and the unconscious patient renders these methods ineffective in the majority of the cases. Very important, even with the use of an oral pharyngeal or artificial oral pharyngeal airway, the pharynx is not kept patent unless both hands 
of the rescuer are used to hold the head in extension and to support the mandible. So what they found is that even with the OPA in place, right, the pharynx is not kept patent unless the operator uses both hands to lift the mandible upwards, right, and extend the head over the atlanto-occipital position, essentially performing the triple airy maneuver. Right? And just to show you, right, you see this is the tongue, the genioglossus muscle, connected to the mandible, and uh, when it relaxes, right, when it relaxes, it will fall backwards, occluding the laryngeal inlet. And it doesn't matter what OPAs you place in there, unless you physically lift this jaw forward, right, there's no way you're going to get uh, entry of air into the laryngeal inlet. This is just uh, a few other cadavers to show you this, right? You see how the tongue falls back? On an unconscious person, there's no muscle tone. So they cannot control this, this will fall back. Uh, just a close-up view again. This will fall back, occluding the laryngeal inlet. And as you could see here, right, same same thing. The next study uh, was done in 1959, uh, again by Peter Joseph Safar. It was titled "Upper Airway Obstruction in the Unconscious Patient." And what they found is when they placed the patient supine with the chin tucked, and they employed the OPA, you notice that no patients had an open airway. So zero patients, zero percent had an open airway, and that's with an OPA in place with no maneuvers uh, of uh, displacement of the jaw. So OPA by itself is not effective, right? The next uh, thing they looked at is when they actually performed the triple airway maneuver with the OPA in place at the bottom, and you see that 78 patients or 98% had patent open airway versus, right, just an OPA by itself at zero patients, zero percent. So we want to use OPA in conjunction with a triple airway maneuver for patients who have no cervical spine injury and just the uh, jaw lift uh, for patients who do have a cervical spine injury, right? And they said the most frequently overlooked obstruction of the oral pharynx is the relaxed tongue, which is pushed back, pushed uh, against the posterior pharyngeal wall. So yeah, that makes sense. When uh, uh, you're unconscious, the tongue falls back, and especially when your neck is flexed, right? This is basically a kink. So there's no way you're going to introduce any ventilation or oxygenation to your patient when the patient is in this position. Right? And the reason why I want to show you this is that when we pra practice in the lab, we use these uh, mannequins, which are made with the tongue, which is not obstructing right, the laryngeal inlet, because the tongue is forward. I just showed you on that cutout. However, on a real patient or on a cadaver, this will not be the case. The tongue will fall back and will occlude the laryngeal inlet. That's why when you're ventilating these mannequins, even if you use the bat, bat technique, you're still going to get chest rise. On an actual patient who is unconscious, use the bat technique, you ain't going to get any chest rise. Right? So this is the study that I showed you how to size the OPA correctly. Uh, it was titled Determination of the Appropriate Sizes over Oral Pharyngeal Airways in Adults and Correlation with External Facial Measurements. So here, uh, they used... Uh, the sizing from corner of the mouth to the angle of the jaw and central incisors to the angle of the jaw. And what they discovered is that here, right, when they employed the central incisors to the angle of the jaw, pretty much all the patients had the patent airway and ease of ventilation. And they found uh, uh, in their um, data points is that all patients with maxillary incisors to the angle of the jaw had clear manual ventilation, where those uh, partially obstructed uh, had um, um, the patients with corner of the mouth to the angle of the mandible, and it was about 8 to 6%. So, again, the central incisors to the angle of the mandible produced clear manual ventilation, where those with a corner of the mouth to the angle of the mandible uh, had some partial obstruction. So, employ the techniques that I showed you, where you essentially size your OPA, employing, right, the central incisors to the angle of the mandible, versus using the corner of the mouth to the angle of the jaw. So this technique was more efficacious. And as long as you keep in mind that this device does not keep the tongue out of the airway, it's only there to not allow the operator from closing the mouth. 